that's really loud. Whew. I'll talk like Kurt and be really low. <laughs> you got me, whoa. Volume is down. Not, okay, turn me off in the, uh, the these things. Hey, okay, wow. Can you hear me out there now? Huh? Oh, there we are. Okay. Is that good? Okay. Whew. It's hard sliding a button, apparently. <laughs> I love you, Scott. Well, if you have your bulletins, uh, you'll be able to see the announcements uh, for the week. Of course, evening services tonight as regularly scheduled, Wednesday regularly scheduled, and then third, oh, that messed me up, Wednesdays before Tuesday. Tuesday is God's Fight Club, <laughs> and then Wednesday is regularly scheduled programming. Uh, Thursday and Friday is the annual meeting at South Parksburg Baptist. Uh, we got several folks um, going, uh, three of us as delegates, the, the others as because um, of the size of our congregation, we can only have three delegates. So if there's anything that needs voted on, Pastor Justin, Shelly, and myself are the voting delegates. But we have several folks who are going representing our church, which is really awesome. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited about that. Um, and then Saturday is Writing in Faith in, uh, of course, Elizabeth. Um, and then it says 1021 at Writing in Faith Horse Show, which I think is Saturday, right? Okay. She was in a hurry, so... It's all good. No big deal. At least we have a bulletin. Amen? At least we have a bulletin. Amen? Amen. All right. We have something to look at. So, there's that for the week. All right. We are going to be in Philippians chapter 2 this morning. So, if you guys want to go ahead and start turning there, that'd be dandy. I didn't have my Bible already turned there. I should have been prepared, huh? Philippians 2 is where we're going to be this morning. Well, it is with excitement that I get to bring you a message on love today. I'm glad glad two of you are excited for it. It's with excitement that I get to bring you a message on love today. There we go. Um, I I would be remiss if I didn't um, uh, uh, mention officially as we get started from the pulpit uh, to remember Israel. Um, They are under uh, bombardment from almost every direction and it appears that um, a a second group is starting a war uh, as of last night. Hezbollah, which is the Iranian-backed um, front, so um, Russia is supporting Iran, Iran supporting Hezbollah and Hamas, and Israel is under constant bombardment. Um, and and we know our Bibles here. We know uh, that 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 land and those people in Israel are God's chosen, and we stand boldly and proclaim that we support Israel as a as a church. Amen. So continue to remember them. Continue to pray. But most of all, please pray that they get saved. And what I mean by that is that they come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior and and realize that the Messiah has already come and Jesus 2,000 years ago. And so above all, above their safety, above their provision, above all of that, we need to be praying for Israel and the people's um, salvation through Jesus. Um, And so this morning, love part eight... Uh, humbly love others. And we, we've been talking for two months now about love and how it's the foundation of our Christian faith. Amen? Let me ask you something. As we've been on this series for the last two months, this isn't in my notes, so this is a quick poll. Uh, I'd like for you to participate, so show me your hands. Over the last two months, has anybody been stirred in your spirit that you need more love in your life? Okay. All of us. Wow. Um, have, have, has anybody been stirred to look at, at people and situations and things differently than before? 
Awesome. Uh, and along those, those lines, has anybody been stirred that we need to start giving the benefit of the doubt and stop assuming the worst in people and things? Yeah. And so that, that's what the Lord had showed me before this. And, and I'm not saying that as a judgmental condemnation for anybody. But the Lord had shown me that we need to, as a group of people, we need to be filled with the spirit of love. And that we've been lacking that quite considerably as a, as a church and as a, a people of Christ. And so that's, that's why we've been on this series of love. Um, you know, we spent a couple months looking at the demonic forces in the world, and, and we've seen how dark and evil the devil and his demons are, and we've seen what they do. And the only way you can counteract darkness is with light, right? If it's dark, you got to shine light for there to be light in the room, Amen. The only way you can counteract demonic activity is by Christ-filled love. Hate, the opposite is love. And so we, we looked at very intensely the demonic forces that are very real around us. We, I mean, we've seen it, we've experienced it, we've felt it. And, and now we're being filled with that love that Jesus calls us to. And we're starting to see that shift in our thinking, that shift in our hearts, that shift that, you know what, we don't need to do an apple fest and, and get together and feel good about ourselves like we're a country club, but rather we need to do something where we can get the community involved and bless the community. And, and while we're blessing them, we're going to give them Jesus instead of getting together for two days and being a social club. And, and don't get me wrong, the fellowship has been awesome. The work has been awesome. But now we're thinking, how can we do it next year to reach people for Christ? And so that's the thought that the Lord's been leading us to. And, and as we've seen in 1 Corinthians 13, love is a verb. It's an action, right? It's something you do. You don't just say, I love you, but you show love. There's action behind it. And so, um, you know, we've looked at some very important things over the last two months. And I'm just going to quickly summarize with the passages that supported them. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 13, which we started in 1 Corinthians 13 for about a month. And to summarize 1 Corinthians 13 is this verse right here. And now abide faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is... Good job, guys. That's awesome. The greatest of everything is love. And so that summarizes 1 Corinthians 13 and who we need to be. As a people of Jesus, we need to be people of love. Then we moved on, and we looked at Matthew 22, 37, and 38. At the two greatest commandments, Jesus summarized the Ten Commandments. The first four is, is verse 37, and Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And so we saw Jesus tell us, the greatest thing you can do, the best thing we as believers can do is to love God above everything. The first four of the Ten Commandments are summarized in this one verse. We see that we are to love, love God above everything. But then Jesus didn't stop there, right? He, he said the next six commandments, five through ten, are summarized in verse 39, and, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so we've seen that, that love is the greatest of all things. And, and through that, we love God. And then we love others. And then to add one more exclamation point this morning, Romans 13, 10. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Do you see that? Jesus took the Ten Commandments, summarized them two ways. Love God, love others. And he says that love does no wrong. And love is the fulfillment of the law. And we as a church, not just Sunrise, but the vast majority of, of, of the church doesn't have love. I mean, honestly, how easy is it for us to not love? I mean, let's be real with each other. How easy is it to not love? You know, we, 
we in this family grate each other's nerves. We in this family don't give the benefit of the doubt. We in this family don't love like we should. How can we expect anyone else to want to be a part of that when we're not doing it? And if we're not doing it within our family, how are we going to do it to others? You know what I mean? I mean, it's, it's one thing, it's one thing to, to love our neighbors ourselves, but that also includes the people in this room. It's not just loving the neighbor out there, but it's also in here. It's twofold. We got to love each other. And, and I think that once we love each other the way we're called to, it's going to be a lot easier to love the, the unlovable. Does that make sense? But we, we don't. Now, let me, let me encourage you because over the last month, I've seen a drastic shift. I started the, the questioning, do we feel we need it? And everybody said yes. Well, many of us in this room and listening online have taken that to heart. And I'm seeing a shift back to love. I'm seeing that shift of us going back to loving each other. Loving our neighbors. And, and that's what we got to continue doing. I don't say that to say we've made it. I say that to encourage us and to say we've made progress. Let's keep marching forward. Let's keep moving forward. We're doing a better job. We can do better yet. And we're going to get there. And so I see that improvement. And, and sometimes that love is just us shutting our mouths. Amen? We all agree on that. So, our scripture text this morning comes out of Philippians 2. We're going to read 1 through 11. And uh, so if you're physically able this morning, I'm just going to invite you to stand with me as we give honor and respect to the Holy Word of God as we proclaim Philippians 2, 1 through 11 this morning. So if there's any encouragement in Christ any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that all at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let us pray. Lord God, we love you this morning. We bless you and we praise you. We lift your name on high. And Father, we thank you for this word. We proclaim it boldly. And Father, we proclaim that your word is truth and that it will go out and do exactly what you want in our hearts and minds and souls, whether here in person, listening online right now, live or in the future, Father. We pray that your Holy Spirit would grab a hold of us, that your Holy Spirit would do the work that you have set for the Holy Spirit to do. Transform us, mold us, change us, fill us with your love, Father. Let us become the people you've called us to be to love you and love others and fulfill the law that you've called us to fulfill. Father, we bless you and praise you now. Preach through me with power and authority. Anoint me from on high from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. We love you now in Jesus' holy name. And everybody said, you may be seated. So it's interesting, those, those last verse, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father in verse 10, that every knee will bow. 
Most every Christian has heard that at some point of your life, right? That every knee will bow, every tongue conf- will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We, we know that, but we, we often forget the first set of verses before it. Or we, we maybe don't even know it or maybe never heard it preached. But we've got to understand um, context, context, context. This is vitally important. As, as you understand the Bible, we want to take bits and pieces and read it. People will create doctrines. People will justify whatever they want by doing that. The Bible was never meant to be read one verse and say, all right, this is exactly the heart and mind and soul of God, and this is the doctrine I'm going to stand and die on. That's not the way the Bible was ever meant to be read. And we've all heard it said, context, 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 right? Well, wow, I totally butchered this. I did? Okay. I wondered where it was at. No, I was... No. Wow. I missed missed some. Oh, well. Um, I'll go back to this. That's what happens when you stop in the middle of apple butter (laughs) to do the PowerPoint really quickly so you can get back to helping. You miss things. But here, I mean, here's the the deal. We've all heard it said before, location, 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 right? Y'all have heard that when you're talking about real estate? I know Lisa has. (laughs) Being a real estate agent, you know she has. But here's the deal. When you're reading the Bible, what you need to think to yourself, context, context, context. It is vitally important as you read the word of God to get the context that surrounds what you're reading. And and don't just jump in a verse and go, ah, that's exactly what I thought. That validates and justifies what I thought. It's awesome. That's not the way you read the word of God. You empty your mind, you empty your heart, you empty your soul of any preconceived bias or notion, and then you go in to read the word and say, all right, Lord, what do you got for me? What is the Holy Spirit going to show me through this passage? And that's how you read the word. And if you jump into this, it says, um, in in the version we just read is the uh, ESV, as a matter of fact. And it says, so... Now, isn't it odd that you start Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 with so? Does anybody else catch that? Isn't that odd? New King James says, therefore. I think King James says, uh, wherewith. If, okay. Um, But did anybody catch that? So? I mean, doesn't that sound like it should be at the end of something? Right? Right? I mean, if, if, if you start, like, if, if I just walk up to you and go, so, I mean, don't you normally think there should have been something before? Right? Isn't that the English language? Okay, so except for the young teenagers who start sentences with so, <laughs> the Bible does, and I'm about to show you. About to show you. So here we go. All right. Context, context, context. Check out Philippians 1, 27 through 30. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him but also suffer for his sake engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. So, if there is any encouragement. Chapter 2 verse 1 should be put together with the end of chapter 1. And then this makes more sense. And so what, I I know I ordered that goofy, and I apologize for that. It would have been a lot easier if I'd put it together, huh? I apologize for that. 
But as you read that, we need to understand that the last four verses of chapter 1 are a prelude to chapter 2. We need to understand that they go together. So chapter 2 starts talking about love, but then you're like, so if there's any encouragement. Wait, what? Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still had. So if there is any encouragement. Does that make more sense? I've lost some of you and it's because I put it together oddly, so I apologize. Here's the crux of what I'm saying. Take the end of chapter 1 and put it on the front of chapter 2 and read it together. And then you'll get what Paul's saying here. Does that make more sense? Okay. All right. I apologize. Thank you. Thank you. But we do learn a few things out of chapter 1, 27 through 30. That's going to be very important to what's going on here. So let's look at that. First of all, our lives should be worthy of the gospel of Christ. As we're talking about love and we get into love, the first thing we learn is that our lives as believers should be worthy of the gospel of Christ. How many of us feel worthy of the gospel? I don't. Does anybody feel worthy of the gospel? The good news of Jesus. So what does Paul mean then? Our lives should be worthy of the gospel. It means that every day, friends, we should be striving to be like Christ. We're never going to be worthy, but we try. And so let me ask you, are you trying? Are you trying your best? Are you doing 100% what God's calling you to do? Do you mess up? Yeah, absolutely. But are you at least trying? Every day seeing even a smidgen of improvement, a smidgen of growth, a smidgen of transformation then you're doing what God's calling you to do. If you're not seeing change in your life, then you're not fulfilling this. But if you're seeing growth and transformation, and it might be small, but if you're seeing that, then you're working towards that worthy of the gospel of Christ. The next thing we learn is that we stand firm in the defense of the gospel in unity and do not be afraid. Now, it's real easy for us in our comfy pews with our heater, air conditioner, usually heat in the morning and air conditioning in the afternoon in West Virginia, right? It's easy to sit here with our fancy lights and our fans and our projector screen and and all these fancy things we have. It's real easy to, to say, do not be afraid. It's different if you're sitting in Israel right now, isn't it? It's different if you're sitting in the Gaza Strip or in Ukraine, or in South Korea. It's a lot different if you're sitting in these war zones than it is for us in in Appalachia, amen? And here's the deal, it's coming, so get ready. We're not exempt from the craziness of the devil. We're not exempt from it, so get ready. I don't know when, but it'll be on our doorstep, doorstep soon enough. And you need to stand firm in the defense of the gospel. In unity. We'll stand up for all sorts of things. And, I, and I, 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 this was a joke, so I'm going to use the story about John just because it was a joke and it's funny. But it, it'll drive home the illustration, so if it offends you, I'm sorry, brother. I don't think it will. I don't know how many of you know, but about four or five years ago, uh, John Boy boycotted um, Jimmy John's. Thank you. Do you know why he boycotted Jimmy John's? They didn't have salt. <laughs> and it was a joke. It was a joke. He wasn't being serious. He, he still eats there to this day. But he does have to bring his own salt shaker. <laughs> but, you know, it's a good illustration. Man, we'll stand up for a lot of things, right? Why don't we stand up for the gospel? Why don't we tell our brothers and our sisters, you know what, you're wrong. I love you. Man, I love you. But what you're doing is wrong. There's no way God told you to do that. There's no way God told you this. There's no way God told you that. You're wrong. I love you. But you're wrong. We don't do that, do we? What do we do? We talk about them and we gossip. 
and we alienate them instead of going and saying, I love you, man. I love you, brother. I love you, sis. But man, this is wrong. How can I help you get better? How can I help you? And they may, they may spit in your face. They may spit in your face and not receive it one bit. And, and here's what Here's what I told Shelly with the situation we're dealing with, that I'm dealing with. I said, I need to do something, and it doesn't matter what the response is. They can spit in my face. They can say, I don't accept your apology. They can do whatever. I've got to be at the place where it doesn't matter what the response back to me is, that I'm doing it because it's the right thing to do. And that's how we have to be able to try to help our brothers and sisters and stand up for the gospel. You know what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you receive what I have to tell you. I love you enough to say, hey, this is wrong. Because if if we're going to be honest, it's real easy to say God told me and then we do whatever we want. Am I right? It's real easy to say, well, God told me, so I'm just going to go do this, that, and the other, and it's okay. Where's it backed up by what God really tells us? You see, because Christianity in America has gotten in a bad name and gotten in a lot of trouble because there's a lot of quote-unquote prophets who stand and say, God told me, and then they have no scripture to back it up. They have nothing but their revelation. Well, guess what, friends? God's revelation is right here. If it goes against Scripture, it's not from God. God will never go against His Word because that would make Him a liar. And God cannot lie. And so if we're doing something in our lives, we're never going to defend the gospel If we're making our own choices about what's right and wrong. If we're making our own choices about what we do or what we don't do. If we can't back it up with scripture, guess what? It's wrong. So we as a church, especially, especially, especially as the world is becoming much, 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 much more biblically illiterate. Most people don't know the Bible And most people sitting in churches don't know the Bible. And it's scary, friends. All right, I don't want to camp here too long. Opponents of Christ will be destroyed. Take encouragement, friends. The opponents of Jesus will be destroyed. We don't know when. It might be today. It might be a thousand years. We don't know. But eventually, the opponents of Jesus will be destroyed. Take heart in that, knowing that if you're standing up doing what's right... God has your back and will defend you and your opponents will be destroyed. It might not be right away. You might suffer a bit, but it will happen. We learn in one, chapter 1, 27 to 30, persecution for your faith is a clear sign of your salvation. Let that sink in a minute. Paul said very clearly in chapter 1, verse, I think, 29, 28 or 29, Here, I'll look real quick instead of. uh, Verse 28. He says very clearly that if you're being persecuted for your faith, that is a clear sign of your salvation. Think about that. How many of us are being persecuted for our faith? Now, I'm. Let me be clear. I'm not talking about you sin and God whips you and go, well, I must be being persecuted. That's not the same thing. That's God whipping you or letting the devil have his way with you, one of the two. Persecution for your faith is when people mock you. They laugh at you. They say say things about your witness. They say things about your preaching. I get that one all the time, friends. I mean all the time. They say things about your walk with Christ. How many of us are actually getting persecuted for our faith? If someone showed up with a gun and said, Who believes? 
You're going to die. How many of us would raise our hands and say, I'm ready to meet my maker? All right, so now I put them together for you. Chapter 1, verse 30, and chapter 2, verse 1. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy. Doesn't that just smoothly read together now? So we see that the context of love starts with this idea of persecution and this idea that Paul just talked about, about standing fast. We're to love in the face of persecution. We're to love standing on the word of God. We are to love by being Jesus. And so what's the point of all of this? We read all that and we think, what does that have to do with love? And Paul's talking about being persecuted. In fact, it's most likely the case that Paul wrote this letter while he was either in prison or on house arrest. Now, can you imagine for a minute you're in prison or on house arrest because you're a believer? Not because you committed a crime, but just because you love Jesus. You're in prison and in writing a letter about loving others. How many of us would be able to do that? How many of us would be able to to take that persecution, knowing that we went to prison because we love Jesus, we proclaim the gospel, we stand in defense of the faith, and still write about loving those people that put you there? Can you imagine? Many of us are sitting there going, well, pastor, really, I don't think I could do that. And I understand that. I truly understand that. And so let's break down what's happening here, okay? Paul is saying that when you're going to go through hard times, that you're going to go through hard times, the Lord shows up. Can anybody attest to that when you go through hard times, the Lord shows up? Amen? Amen. Praise God. And Paul says there's five ways that God shows amazing grace and love, and and then he calls us to action. So before he shows up, or before we get the call to action... We see how God shows up. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, God shows up in our lives amazing, in amazing ways. And and what we see is the first thing is God shows up with encouragement from Christ. Have you ever been miserable, depressed, horrible? You're sitting there maybe by yourself and all of a sudden... The Holy Spirit gives you this thought and encourages you and builds you up. Or you get a text message out of the blue. Or you read a devotion that speaks to exactly what you're talking about. Or you turn on a a, a sermon and it's exactly what you're going through. Have you ever got any of that before? That's God through the Holy Spirit giving you encouragement when you're going through hard times. But one of the other ways is that we must encourage one another. How many of us are very good at encouraging each other? How many of us can go, you know what, I'm really good at it. I encourage all the time. We all have work to do, friends. We all have work to get better at encouraging each other. And this is an area, I'll I'll be honest, that I've, I've... totally lacked in. But God's working and changing me to get better at encouraging. Because you think about it. How much better is it when you're struggling and someone comes along and just says a really encouraging thing to you and it builds you up? And the opposite of that, somebody comes along and says, well, man, you you should be doing better. What's wrong with you? Does that build you up or tear you down? Tears us down, doesn't it? So we are called to encourage one another. And doesn't that sound like love to you? I think so. Comfort from love. 
So the next thing Paul says when we're suffering and being persecuted, that we get comfort from God. We get comfort, agape love, which is action, love from God. Has anyone ever just blessed you out of the blue, just been like, hey, here you go. God told me to do this. And you don't even know what to do with that. You're just in awe. That's God showing up and showing off in our lives saying, hey, I love you. I told my, my child to do this for you. So, so God gives us comfort in the hard times by doing things for us, showing up and, and, and giving us comfort. But he also gives us agape love, action love from others. It's nice when we can show up and help each other. It's nice when we can do things for one another. It's nice when we just love each other. Not expecting anything in return. If I ever ask you for help, don't say, yeah, I'll help you because I know one day uh, I'm going to need help. Because that completely is the opposite of love. You don't do something for someone expecting something. You just do something because you want to love them. Because you want to be the hands and feet of Christ. You just love because it's the nice thing to do. It's the Jesus thing to do. Because if you tell me, yeah, I'll help you because I'm going to need it, I probably won't take your help. I'll be honest with you. I'll say I'll find somebody else. I don't want your help. Love you. Mean it. But that's not the kind of love I want. Next, Paul says, when we're suffering and going through persecution... That God shows up with participation in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit shows up and uses you. The Holy Spirit shows up and uses you to love others and to encourage. Let me tell you something. When you participate in the Holy Spirit's work, it doesn't matter how far down you are, it will lift you up. I, I guarantee you, you're miserable, you're depressed, you're going through a hard patch, Get to church and then go out and serve somebody. And I guarantee you, every time it will build you up. You think, I just showed up to bless somebody and hear God's blessing me. And it's because you're participating in the Holy Spirit's work. And he uses you. God shows up with affection Another word for this, also known as, is tender mercies. Man, I tell you what, there are so many times that we do not get what we deserve. That's what mercy is. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. This is punishment. This is judgment. You sin, you deserve to pay for that. I sin, I deserve to pay for that. But God shows up. And gives mercies. And he shows up and he says, you know what? I'm not going to punish you for that this time. That's mercy. That's affection. And man, if we all got what we deserved, how horrible would it be? Amen? Can I get a witness to that? Like, wouldn't it just be horrible if God really gave us what we deserve? So God shows up in our suffering and persecution with love, with tender mercies. He also shows up with sympathy, compassion, pity, and mercy. I, I confess to you guys over the last couple weeks, this is one of those areas I've been bad at. I've been the rub some dirt in it when you get hurt guy. You know that, right? This is another area that God's softening me on. Another area where I'm trying to be sympathetic, I'm trying to have compassion, I'm trying to be, uh, to give pity and mercy. And, and I was raised tough, I was raised hard, I was raised, you know, you, you work through it, and you, you, if you hurt, you just keep going forward until you can't work anymore, you know. Just that mentality of you don't stop no matter what, and I'm trying real hard to have sympathy. Because not everybody was raised the way I was the way I was. Not everybody has the same thought process I do. Not everybody has the same way of thinking that I do. 
And so giving that benefit of the doubt and having sympathy and compassion is pretty tough. Can I, can I tell the story about Fall Rally? Uh, about the other nurse? <laughs> Allison's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> so they were at Fall Rally, and uh, another youth pastor was sitting there, and his wife is a nurse too, and, and they were talking about how uh, Pastor Justin and the youth pastor are wimps when they get hurt or sick or anything like that. And uh, they're both nurses, and they're like, you know, suck it up, buttercup t- kind of situation. And, and they, were, they were laughing because they have no sympathy for, for their husbands, and they were both, you know, just in, enjoying that. And I don't know that Pastor Justin enjoyed it very much. He said no. But when, you, when you're raised a certain way or you're in a certain line of work, you expect certain things because that's how you are. But friends, not everybody's the same. And, 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 and I got to tell you, if you all were like me, this world would be pretty bad. I don't think you do. <clears throat> but seriously, sympathy, compassion, tender mercies, participation in the Spirit, God loving us and us loving others. Comfort and encouragement. Those are five ways God shows up and gives us love when we're going through hard times. Can y'all, can y'all testify to that? And, and so you think about that. Like, if God does that for us, man, shouldn't we be doing that to others? Shouldn't we be doing that for others? And so it takes changing your mind. And as we start through verses 2 through 5 of chapter 2, we read this. Paul says, Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility... Count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not, to, not only to his own interests, but, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is in Christ Jesus. So we started this passage by seeing suffering and persecution, defending the gospel, moves to God loving us, And when God loves us, we move into verses 2 through 5. Do you see that? The last five verses of chapter 1 go together. The conjunction is verse 1 with God loving us, which moves to verses 2 through 5 of us loving others. Do you see it now? Does that picture, that tapestry become more clear? If you just started in chapter 2, you'd miss that. If you just read... To the end of chapter 1, you'd miss the conjunction in the loving others part. It goes together as one. What did Jesus say? Love God and love others, right? What did we see? We, we suffer persecution. God loves us. Now we love others. The, the scriptures are all the same. They go together. It's a beautiful picture. And so Paul tells believers to fulfill his joy. <laughs> He's suffering persecution. He's in jail. And he says, complete my joy. How many of us are not only going to not love others when we're in jail for persecution, but not have joy in it? Man, you might be going through a hard time right now. How many of you have joy? Brother Larry shared a story this morning in, in our deacon time. And uh, he was reading a devotion, and a journalist had saw a, uh, during World War II, had saw a soldier standing there looking at a hole in the ground. This hole in the ground is where his house used to be. And the journalist, the reporter, goes up and he says, uh, excuse me, soldier, uh, what, are you, what, are you, what are you doing here? And he said, well, he said, my house used to stand here. And he said, I always wanted a house with a basement. Now I've got a basement and I can build the house of my dreams on top of it. 
Standing in a war zone in World War II, his house is gone, and look at the positivity. Looking at the joy of the situation. (laughs) Man, you can't make this stuff up. Look how God weaves all of this together. What do you choose? What's your mind? Do you choose the positive and look at what God's doing, or do you always go to the negative? Those of you that always go to the negative, I'm going to call you out if you're willing. Raise your hand, and I'm raising mine. It's a hard life, isn't it? It's a hard life. We have to, friends, change our minds. We have to choose every day, every situation, a million times a day to choose. I'm not going to let the joy be stolen from the devil. Ain't going to do it. I'm going to choose to look at what God's doing. I'm going to choose to look at how good God is. I'm going to choose to praise him in the storm as the song we sang. I'm going to choose to be filled with the joy and complete Paul's joy. I'm going to choose it. (laughs) It's a choice. We can choose joy or we can choose negative. The word escaped me for a moment. (laughs) I'm like, ugh. So here's what Paul says out of those. Friends, this is a call to action for you. We have the opportunity to bring joy to men and women of faith. Think about that for a minute. You and I have opportunities to bring joy to the people around us. It starts here. We got to bring joy to each other, encourage each other, lift each other up, build each other up, then we can do it for the outside. If we're not doing it in here, God's never going to bless this church and use us to lead people to salvation. We got to be encouraging, building, bringing joy to one another. Elmo's like, I bring joy to church all the time. (laughs) That was such a bad dad joke. Do you choose joy? Do you choose to bring joy? What do you choose? Do you choose? I mean, Jesus for three and a half years of ministry knew what was coming. It wasn't like the day before in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was like, oh, this is what's happening. Jesus knew his whole life. And yet he still lived and breathed and gave joy his whole life. We are to be filled with the same love as Paul. What love does Paul have? Well, Paul was persecuted so you and I can be Christians. Paul was persecuted so the gospel could go out. Paul was beaten. Paul was shipwrecked. Paul was bitten by a snake. Paul Suffered imprisonment and house arrest multiple times. Paul suffered the loss of a friend because the friend thought he knew better and went his own way. Well, guess guess who made it in the Bible? Paul. And and the friend came back to Paul and was like, yeah, can we minister together now? And so Paul lost friends because they didn't see God's will and vision and plan. All because he loved people enough. To give him Jesus. He says we are to be filled with the same love that Paul has. Do we love each other? Do we love the community around us enough to share Jesus with them? I hope so. Man, I pray so. And if not, we have time to change, amen? We have time to get it right. We have time to let the Holy Spirit change us. He suffered immense persecution for the faith 
in Jesus. He, and he eventually died for his faith in Jesus. But he still wrote letters to the churches. He still witnessed and taught and gave Jesus. We are to have unity. Friends, the devil has caused so much division in this church. Every time we start making progress, somebody backs down from their faith and lets the spirit of division cause division in our midst. Over and over and over and over. And we listen to self which is being spun up and talked to by the devil. We saw that in Scripture, that self is being pushed and relied and talked to by the devil and his demons. And every time we start making progress, the devil causes division. We've seen it for 10 years now. 10 years. We start getting on track, and all it takes is one person. To cause division. Isn't that sad? That as a church we let one person cause division. And so we have to have unity. Because unity is actually love. If you think about it. When you're unified in the name of Jesus doing the work of Christ. Isn't that love? That's love friends. We are to be Selfless. Friends, you and I are called to be selfless. And we're to teach our kids that. We've got generations coming up now that are selfish. Man, these younger generations, not all of them. I don't want to lump all of them in, so so please don't think I'm doing that. But man, this younger generations are selfish. And we've got to do a better job of not only being selfless ourselves, but teaching the next generations that. Man, I I love our kids here. But if I acted the way some of our kids act here, I would have got knocked into next week. I would have absolutely been, I'd have lost teeth. And, And yet, we continue to just allow it. And by we, I mean the parental or guardian unit of these children. Continue to allow the disrespect. And you think about it. When we allow them to make their own choices to be, to be mean and disrespectful, we're t- actually teaching them selfishness. I do what I want. I'm going to do what I want and nobody's going to tell me otherwise. Well, go tell a cop that and see if they're just going to let you get off if you break the law. We're we're doing a disservice to our young people. We're doing a disservice by not teaching them to be selfless and to teach them discipline and respect. And so we've got to get that right. We have to get that right. We have to be the examples and then teach our kids to be selfless, not selfish. Love others so much we count them more significant than ourselves. Oh boy, that's tough, isn't it? That's, that's tough. Boy, that's tough. That means I might not get what I want. <laughs> that means things might not be done the way I want them done. That means I may have to just shut my mouth and go along with what the Spirit's doing. Counting others more significant than ourselves. Wow, that's tough, isn't it? That's tough. Look out for each other and help each other out. We talk about bearing one another's burdens. We talk about accountability partners. But how many of us are doing that? How many of us are willing to have an accountability partner that will say, you know what, enough's enough. I love you, but stop. I love you, but you're wrong. I love you, but you're not being backed up with scripture. I love you, but you got to get it right. I love you, but stop. That's looking out for each other. 
I mean, think about it. If a group of you were walking along and there was a, a big hole in the road and you saw it and they weren't, would you just stand back and watch them walk into the hole and go, ha, 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 ha. you fell in the 10-foot hole. We're not doing that. We wouldn't do that, right? But isn't that what we do when we're not helping each other with spiritual things? We're absolutely letting each other fall and not, help, not doing anything about it. Paul says to help each other, to look out for each other, to be there for one another. We are to be filled with the mind of Jesus. Who doggy. You can summarize all of those things we just said with this last scripture in verse 5. We are to be filled with the mind of Jesus. How many of us are doing that? How many of us are being filled with the mind of Jesus? Friends, we've got room for improvement. And we're going to get better, amen? We're going to get better. I know we are. I believe it. I believe there's a turning point that has happened in our midst, and we're going to get better. We are absolutely going to get better, and we're going to have the mind of Christ, and we're going to do these things because I see the shift in you. I see the transformation. I see God moving in your lives and you wanting more of Jesus and less of self. And I'm so thankful to see this. I'm so grateful to see this, and I'm encouraged by this. To see what's, what the Lord's about to do in our midst. And so, the mind of Christ, verses 6 through 11, is this. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming Obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory, amen. To the glory of God the Father. So now, Paul said in verse 5, he said, Have the mind of Christ. And then he goes in 6 through 11 and tells us the mind of Christ. Wow. The mind of Christ was that he was obedient to the point of death. He was humble and obedient. You can sum up the mind of Christ. With, in those passages, with two words, obedience and humility. Wow. We want to see the Lord move in our lives. Obedience and humility. Hmm. Wow. How many of us are obedient to the Spirit? How many of us are obedient to the mind of Christ? How many of us are, obe are obedient to the Holy Scriptures? You're never going to get anywhere further until you humble yourselves and you become obedient. You've got to. I've got to. We have to humble ourselves and become obedient to Christ. Even though he was God in the flesh, he acted like a human. You think about it. The King of kings and Lord of lords, God in the flesh, who had every right to walk around and say, do this, do that, or else. I am God in the flesh, do what I say or else. He had every single reason to boast and to, to tell anybody and everybody what to do. But he didn't, did he? He taught. He loved. He was humble. Think about that for a minute. You might have the best spiritual gifts in the world. 
But if you're arrogant and you don't love, it means nothing. How humble are we? How humble are we? Jesus was God in the flesh, but he decided to put on humanity. The greatest humility ever shown in eternity. Jesus became a servant. Jesus served. You remember when he washed the disciples' feet? You remember that? Talk about humility. That's what you ought to do with the youth. Teach them that humility and let them wash each other's feet. It's humbling, friends. But how are we going to serve others if we can't even serve our brothers and sisters? Jesus served. You know, it's all in well. It's all well and good to say I'm gonna, I'm gonna join a ministry. It's all well and good to say, hey, you know what? I show up a couple hours a week. But how many of us are actually getting involved in serving? You'll 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 be interested probably to know that next year there's gonna be a lot less on the calendar. We're gonna cut way back the things that we try to do. Because we are going to make it all about loving others. Reaching the lost. Outreach. We've lost that. And we've got to get back to that. And so we're going to cut back on the amount of things we have going on. So that none of us can say, well, I'm too busy. Or I, I this or that. We're going, to, we're going to have a schedule. And for like four or five things throughout the year, that's it. And you're going to be able to put them on your calendars and be able to say, you know what? I'm ready to love and serve others. Look at the light just shining in. Just got really bright. Wow. He humbled himself to the point of fulfilling God's plans for others. Think about it. Why did Jesus go to the cross? It was for us. Why do we do what we do? Is it because we want to love others? Or is it because we want to build our name? Is it because we want a big pocketbook? Is it because we want to be famous? Why do we do what we do? Is it to love others? I pray so. I really pray so. But that's why Jesus did what he did. The main and only point for Jesus to die on the cross is for others. Have you ever thought about that? The main and only point for Jesus going to the cross was for others. Loving others. How many of us do that? So, we can see through these passages that we're called to love God and love others. And that love comes through encouraging. It comes through sympathy. It comes through compassion. It comes through acts of service. It comes through being humble. It comes through being obedient. And it comes through service. We love God and we love others. It's simple, friends. It's so simple. But how many of us are filled with that love? The mind of Christ. And friends, I'm afraid that our silence says, I've got a lot of work to do in my life. And if that's the case, then how about we start on our knees in prayer? If you mean it, if you want change, the Lord will give it to you. 
That's the amazing thing about this. If you really want it, the Lord will give it to you. I've made the case in scriptures. I've given you scripture after scripture after scripture. So if you choose not to, you need to understand that you're choosing to be willfully disobedient to God. You've chosen that path if, that's, if you choose not to be filled with love. You've chosen willful disobedience and arrogance that you know better than God. That's a tough thought, a tough thought isn't it? And I pray no, no, nobody in here, nobody online wants that. I don't think anybody does. I think, I think y'all really, really, really want to be filled with love. Just not sure how that looks. Just not sure how that works. Just not sure how to make that step. Because if you're in my group where we are naturally negative and cynical and we see the worst, life is hard. And it's not fun. So we got to change our minds and have the mind of Christ. It's that choice. So I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to stop preaching to you. And just offer you the opportunity here in a minute to come forward. If you don't know what it looks like, you don't know how to move forward, start by just saying, Lord, I don't understand. I don't know. But I don't like who I've become. I don't like the hardness of my heart. I don't like the lack of compassion. I don't like the lack of pity and sympathy. I don't like the lack of love. I don't, la I don't like who I've become, Lord. Will you break the walls? Will you change me and mold me and transform me? I don't want to be the person I've been my whole life. I don't like it. In fact, it's been pretty miserable most of the time. I don't want to be cynical. I don't want to be hateful. I don't want to, I, I, I hate give, not giving the benefit of the doubt to people. Just start by being honest with your Lord Jesus. That's the first thing. You got to lay it on the table. Be humble enough to admit it to the Lord. And then once you lay it on the table with them, then start asking him to transform you. But your first step, you got to be humble and obedient. And you say, well, I'm just going to sit right here, Pastor. You can do that. But as Billy Graham used to say, in every single meeting he ever had, he always called them publicly. There'd be 70,000 people. He said, don't worry, we'll wait. You know why? He said, because Jesus always called them publicly. And he did. And so that's why you being obedient and humble and coming up front. You might not be able to get on your knees. That's okay. Sit down on the front pew and put your, your heart on its knees. But you've made that step to come up. To be humble and obedient just like Jesus called the people. Come up. And I guarantee you, there will be a shift. There will be a shift. You see, because now there's actually some commitment on your part. Now it's not just standing there, but it's actually stepping out and moving forward. You got some skin in the game now. And there's a change in your heart that starts to happen. So I'm going to pray. Worship team's going to come up and I'm going to open the altar. And this goes for the worship team up here. They might be, you might have uh, some time where there's no singing going on. That's okay. That's okay. This is between you and the Lord. Nobody's judging you. But you deal with the Lord as he deals with you today. Let us pray. Father God in heaven, we love you, we bless you, we praise you, Father. We thank you for this message. We thank you for your holy word. Father, thank you for your Holy Spirit that transforms us and molds us. And, and Father, I just pray now in the name of Jesus that, Lord, you will do a work in our hearts and minds. And, and Father, truly bring transformation in our hearts and minds. 
Father, I pray for love to take over the people, their, our hearts and our minds and our souls, and we would choose love, choose the mind of Christ, humility and obedience, Lord, just like Jesus did. Father, fill this place with your spirit, with your love, and Father, do a work now, and I pray for true transformation in our hearts and minds and souls. We love you and bless you and praise you now in Jesus' holy name. Amen.